uh, everyone. Uh, my name is Roy Gutman. <clears throat> I'm the president of the Baltimore Council uh, on Foreign Affairs, and uh, uh, I'm new to WACA, uh, new to this conference, uh, new, new to Baltimore, in fact. Um, and I must say, this is quite an impressive conference uh, with superb speakers uh, and so far, and I hope that, that that will continue. I know that it will. Um, this past spring, like uh, many other councils, uh, we in Baltimore were very focused on Ukraine and Russia um, and um, uh, did many programs, but I had a pr priority of my own as a new coming, incoming president that I wanted to do something uh, uh, that wasn't getting that much attention in public and that subject was Burma. Um, also known as Myanmar. <clears throat> it was at the, top, at the top of my list. But it took me weeks to try to line up a speaker uh, who could speak authoritatively. Um, the UN Special Representative, a former US Congressman, was not answering his email, um, and this probably has happened to you, um, or his phone. Uh, I don't think anybody, I don't think he was doing public speaking at that point. And that was the problem. I couldn't find, I, I, I wasn't sure who was doing public speaking about the situation in Burma. Uh, this is a country of 52 million, uh, bigger population than Ukraine, in fact. Um, the same military which had expelled the Rohingya, Muslim, uh, uh, Rohingya Muslims uh, in a genocide uh, five years earlier had staged a coup in uh, February of uh, last year, um, following the last democratic elections. Uh, and they want an inclusive new state. Uh, news coverage has been very sparse, uh, but I think this deserves to be better known. Uh, so, um, and, and also deserving to be better known is the fact that the NUG has sent a deputy foreign minister to Washington to set up an office. Uh, we met uh, earlier this week, in fact. Uh, Umo Zau uh, is, in fact, well qualified to represent <clears throat> the national unity government. Um, well, of course, like in, in so many revolutionary cases and places where people are trying to get a democracy going, <clears throat> he spent a lot of time in jail. In fact, he spent his 20s in jail. He was in for nine years. <clears throat> um, and uh, this was a trial, he was just telling me, uh, where 16 people were on trial. Um, the, uh, it was a court martial. Uh, the decision came down in one hour. Uh, he didn't have representation, um, and uh, there he was uh, locked away for the 1990s. Uh, but later he became, well, after being freed, uh, after Aung San Suu Kyi, uh, uh, won essentially the uh, first elections in 2015, he became her chief of, deputy chief of staff. 
Um, so um, uh, he's, he's, he's got a lot of qualifications uh, for speaking uh, for the NUG. Uh, Priscilla Clapp is a career foreign service officer with 30 years in government service. Uh, she is a fountain of knowledge about Burma. She has been chief of mission, in fact, in uh, the country <coughs> from 1999 to 2002. Um, she uh, uh, had top posts in South Africa, Moscow, um, Tokyo, and then at the State Department, she it seems like she was working in almost every functional bureau of the State Department, you know, including uh, <coughs> um, policy planning, East Asia, that's the regional bureau, um, political, military, uh, and, um, and arms control. And now she's a senior advisor to the U.S. Institute of Peace. Uh, and they are producing uh, a whole series of, of, of really valuable publications on Burma. Um, Priscilla will offer a, a brief introduction, uh, and then we'll have our fireside chat. Uh, we are missing a fireside. Uh, we are missing a fireplace here, <clears throat> but uh, we'll have to imagine one is sitting there in the middle. Um, without pr further ado, Priscilla Clapp and Uma Zohu. Thank you. Is my mic, yes, my microphone is working, good. Thank you very much, Roy, for the lovely introduction. Um, I am really honored to be sitting next to Deputy Minister Mozo, who I've known of him and known him directly for many years. And uh, it's a pleasure to have him here in Washington, where we're close, close at hand. Um, <clears throat> between us, I would say that we probably know more about Burma, Myanmar, than Tom Andrews, but that's, he has a higher position. Um, I am going to give you a very brief history of how we got to where we are today. There is a tragedy underway in Burma that is on a scale of what's happening in Ukraine, but it doesn't get much attention here, and it should get more attention. Um, it has a very long history, and that history has a lot to do with what's going on today. That's why it's important to have at least a brief history. Um, I have some maps here that I want to show you. Whoops. I've lost my main map there. Um, I'm not handling this very well. the map of the country. For those of you who don't know where it is, this is, this is the situation of Burma in Asia. China, Thailand, a little bit of, a, of a, a, a border with Laos, India, and Bangladesh. A large border with India and a substantial border with Bangladesh. It is geostrategically situated between Southeast Asia and South Asia and plays a very important role in that region. It has a history of isolation under almost 70 years of military governance. And so people haven't really learned as much about um, Burma as they have about other countries in Southeast Asia. When we were, for example, involved in the Vietnam War, Burma was fighting its own anti-communist insurgency quite successfully, so we left them alone and they, they were under a military rule at the time that kept the country closed. Um, the military took over, the, the country became independent after nearly 100 years of British colonialism, became independent in 1948. The military took over government in 1962 and never let it go until they partially let it go in 20, 2010, they had finally had um, elections, free and fair elections, relatively free and fair. The, the uh, Mozo's party, the National League for Democracy, did not run in those elections, so they were missing the majority party, and the elections were not really free and fair. But within two years, the minority party was invited, I mean, the majority party was invited to join the new government, and that's when Aung San Suu Kyi was elected to the parliament. In, in 2012. 
Uh, so for a period of relatively, well, roughly 10 years, 12, yeah, roughly 10 years, from 2011 when the new president was seated until 2021 when there was a military coup in February, almost two years ago. The country had, was relatively free and open. The press sprang forward, a free press. There had been total suppression of free speech under military rule. But th under the new dispensation, the press was allowed to open up, and it became quite early. Um, civil society expanded exponentially. Um, we had been outlawed under the military government. Um, and a whole new generation grew up under the conditions of certainly relative democracy, something that had, the country had not known um, in its post-colonial history. Because for the few years of 1950s, when they were a parliamentary government, it really only held control over a little part of the country. The rest of the country was still in turmoil, left over from World War II. There are, I would say that Burma is probably the most ethnically diverse country in the world. The British counted 135 different ethnicities in the country. As you can see from that map, it's, it's the largest of the Southeast Asian mainland countries, but still compared to its big neighbors, China and India, it's not a very big country. But it is extremely rich in resources, particularly in the northern part because they, they back up to the Himalayan mountains and, they, and the river that comes down through the whole country, the Irrawaddy comes right out of the Himalayas. And it is only in Burma. So they have completely control over, complete control over that river. And that river is a major source of transport in the country. Um, China covets the resources in Burma. And over the years has been mining them out of the country. Um, and I'm talking about all kinds of resources, including um, endangered species and gems and, and uh, um, rare earth and water and anything you can imagine. They're digging it all up. Um, <clears throat> the, see if I can get another map up here. Um, this shows you roughly where the major ethnic armies are. There are a, a whole series of ethnic armies that have been fighting the military for almost the whole 70 years. They are today better equipped, better organized, more professional than they ever were before. They are a serious uh, threat to the military. Um, after the coup, uh, the younger generation that knew what democracy, the, the benefits that democracy could bring, refused to go back to military government. And that's where we came in with the tragedy that's unfolding today. In previous years, before, um, <clears throat> before 2010, the military had kept the different nationalities separate. In, the, in fact, they had pitted them against each other, divide and rule, and they had uh, occupied basically the whole country. They had set up posts all over, even in the, in the areas controlled by, or more or less controlled by ethnic armies. And, and they were brutal, absolutely brutal to the ethnic minorities. Not only the Rohingya, we know about the Rohingya. That's been made abundantly clear, but they have killed and maimed and, and terrorized more people in the other ethnic minorities than they did. The Rohingya is a very minor ethnic minority in the country, ethnic and religious. But there are other large, much larger ethnic minorities that have suffered tremendously under military rule. Um, and they want a greater degree of autonomy. So the young people from the majority ethnic, ethnic group, which is the Bama, from which the name Burma comes, Burma and Myanmar, by the way, are the same thing. Myanmar is the name of the tribe that originally came down from Tibet to start the Bama, the kingdom. Bama was the informal name of 
am, or you can correct me if I'm wrong yeah. when it comes time. But that's my understanding. So even though the military pretends that Myanmar is more inclusive of the minorities, they're absolutely wrong, as they are with everything. It's still the name of the, of the majority group in the country. So there is this divide between the minority and the majority, whether it's military or civilian. So even during the years of democracy, there was still kind of tension between the minorities and, and the civilian government, which was uh, represented by the, represented mainly the majority um, <clears throat> ethnic group. So after the coup, those two came together and, and the deputy minister will tell you more about what is involved. That's what the national unity government is all about. It is the first time in the history, the post-colonial history, or any part of the history of that country, that all of these groups have actually come together with a single purpose. It is very important, and it promises a much better future for the country if they can defeat the military. Now, the military became brutal against peaceful demonstrators early in the, in the early days after the coup. And so eventually, the young people said, the only way we can fight this is to arm ourselves, join forces with the ethnic armies, get trained, get armed. And so two years later, they are actually, they have uniforms, they have arms, they are disciplined. Some of them work together with the ethnic armies fighting the military. Some of them are working alone because they occupy the middle of the country. You can see that great sort of white space in the middle. That's basically where the majority, where the military drew all its support. That is now the, the, the center of the conflict in the country because the Bama population has risen up against its own military. So there is a very serious revolution going on in the country and it has it has the potential to create a much more diverse um, uh, democracy than the country has ever had and it doesn't get enough attention here but the conditions on the ground in the country are very much like what we hear about in Ukraine every day the military is pounding its civilian population with air power missiles that they're getting from Russia, China, and India. Um, and they have a lot of that. They are losing ground troops, just the way the Russians were in Ukraine. Their ground troops are defecting, they're getting killed, they've lost many, many, many. So they're compensating for that with air power. And they're burning whole villages. They've created millions of um, internally displaced people, millions of refugees have fled into Thailand and neighboring countries. There are a lot in India. Some are here. One is sitting right here. Um, the intellectual capital in the country that was built up during the years of freedom has basically been demolished, either by put, being put in prison or leaving the country. And that is what actually powers the National Unity Government. So having set up that history, I'd like to hand it over to my friend, Umo Zau. He will tell you what the NUG is all about. Well, thank you and very correct much. me, by the way, if I've said anything wrong, feel free. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Well, first of all, I would like to thank you for uh, the organizers of uh, this event and inviting me to this uh, very important event. And thank you, President Desre, for explaining uh, everything. Uh, I think that I don't need to talk about that any, anymore because you, what you said is very perfect and complete. <laughs> uh, anyway, I, will, I may repeat a little bit what you said. So, uh, Myanmar, uh, also known as Burma, uh, most of the Americans, is once uh, called by the uh, former uh, Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice as uh, outputs of tyranny uh, together with I Iran and North Korea because we have been and, uh, living in a very repressive military rule for many years. And then in two, 
in, uh, around in 2015, uh, the National Party Congress, led by Aung San Suu Kyi, uh, participated in the elections and won by a landslide, and the military lost the power to the uh, uh, civilian type of uh, government at that time, although it is not totally democratic. And then, uh, after the five years' term, uh, because it is relatively free, uh, uh, and then uh, some young people, especially the young people, got a chance to taste the freedom and democracy uh, during, during the very brief time. Uh, in 2020, the, the National League for Democracy that won the previous election got a chance to hold another election in 2020 uh, November. And then again, the National League for Democracy led by our sensitivity won by the landslide. Uh, so at that time, uh, the international uh, election monitoring groups like the uh, Carter Center, uh, Carter Center uh, led by a late former President Jimmy Carter, and uh, Asian Free Elections uh, Foundations and FRL, and some other uh, election monitoring groups, and diplomatic missions, including ASEAN, EU, and the United States, also got a chance to observe the whole electoral process, the whole electoral process, uh, trying to find whether there are some sort of uh, irregularities or the, uh, some, uh, whether it is free and fair or things like that. Uh, but after the elections, after the right after the election, they released some report immediately, and they said that the elections was free and fair. I didn't find any irregularities that could damage the credibility of the elections. So I would say that the elections was free and fair. Uh, but at that time, the Union Solidarity and Development Party, the military-backed party, uh, started complaining about the electoral frauds or things like that, and demanded the Union Election Commission to investigate the election frauds. Uh, but in fact, there were, there were no election, electoral frauds at all. But uh, to be short and to be brief, uh, finally, on 1st February 2021, the military staged uh, an attempted, I, I would say attempted, uh, mil, mil, uh, coup d'etat. Uh, and then uh, that kind of attempted mil, uh, military coup instigated an a anti-coup movement, which is uh, very much uh, peaceful and a non-violent movement. So uh, in a very peaceful and disciplined way, because at the time, uh, the protested, uh, at, the, uh, at the late evening, all the protested uh, took responsibility to clean the, all the streets, uh, 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 all the, all the, in the public spaces after the, after the protest. So that's a very disciplined uh, protests. But uh, at the end of February, uh, the military started uh, uh, to crack down on the demonstration in a very violent way. Uh, I would say how violent it, it was. Uh, they used snipers and shoot in the heads of the uh, demonstrators, in the heads of the demonstrators. And then later, uh, they even used machine gun and hand grenades and even RPG to disperse the crowds and demonstrations, you could imagine. So uh, uh, the whole world at the time witnessed how brutal the military was. And at that time, uh, the, 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 some people see that the problem was between the military and the national Depot democracy, or uh, the, leader, uh, the leader of the military may outline and the uh, leader of the national Depot democracy, Aung San Suu Kyi. But uh, the problem is not in that way. The problem it, itself was uh, the military and the rest of the people, including the ethnic uh, groups in our country, uh, I would say that this, uh, the, 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 since the military coup, uh, uh, the military trying to 
uh, trying to uh, stabilize a country, stabilize a country. But, uh, and they, they declared a state of emergency and detained the leaders of the uh, government and detained the leaders of the political parties and some members of parliaments as well. Uh, but at that time, uh, civil, disobedience, civil disobedience movement initiated by the uh, medical professionals and medical doctors, uh, and later joined by the civil servants across the country, uh, took a momentum. And uh, people boycotted the military and uh, military affili affiliated businesses brought that. And they didn't even, didn't pay, even pay the taxes. And they uh, didn't even buy the lottery tickets as well because they didn't want to pay uh, uh, for the lottery tickets as a, as a tax as well. And consequently, nationwide popular protests take came place uh, demanding of uh, the state of emergency and the recognition of the uh, uh, election res results. And then on 5th February, uh, the National League for Democracy formed, uh, the parliamentarians formed uh, what we call the committee representing the Pidan Zutluto. Uh, Pidan Zutluto means the Congress, uh, the Senate and House of Representatives combined. So CRPH committee representing the Pidan Zutluto, CRPH. Uh, so um, the military uh, didn't allow the members of the parliament to go to the parliament building. So uh, parliamentarians have to gather at a place where they are living in Nepito, and that they held their, uh, they convened uh, the uh, parliament sessions. Uh, because uh, the military attempted uh, the, uh, the coup d'etat on the very day when the parliament was supposed to be convene, convened. So uh, the, see, uh, the, the parliamentarians uh, held their own parliament session on a place and on a place where they are living, and then they formed the committee representing uh, the Piran uh, with the support of the, uh, about 300 uh, parliamentarians. Uh, and then the, the CRPH abolished the existing constitution. Uh, and then uh, the CRPH formed the National Unity Government, main government, uh, uh, in April. So I would say that the national, national unit government is uh, composed of uh, not only representatives from the winning, election winning party, the National Unity Party Democracy, but also all representatives uh, of the uh, ethnic communities and civil societies and uh, even civil, civil disobedience movement as well. So I would say it is the most inclusive uh, uh, form of the government that we ever had. Uh, so it much different from the previous uh, government, I would say. Uh, and then, I, uh, for example, the president of our say it's Kachin National, Duala Shira, and the prime minister is Karen National, Maimon Kanda, and they are both Christians. Uh, please note the fact that Burma is a Buddhist, uh, mostly Buddhist country, but. President and Prime Minister are both Christians. Uh, and I would like to talk about the, uh, our umbrella organization, uh, the National Unity Consultative Council, which is, a, which is an organization composed of different stakeholders as well. So trying to organize uh, uh, different ethnic groups in our country. And then again, uh, in the National Unity Consultative Council, we invited uh, the civil society groups, civil disobedience groups, uh, and even uh, some political parties and the members of parliaments. So it is a very broad-based umbrella organization that took care of the uh, policy level matters of our country. So the National Unity Consultative Council uh, drafted and approved the, what we call the Federal Democracy Charter. So Federal Democracy Charter outlines the principles for our future federal constitution. Because we have already abolished the existing constitution, so we need to draft the new future constitution. 
Uh, that guarantees a greater autonomy for ethnic groups, highly decentralized form of uh, federalism. And that demands secularism, uh, human rights, and diversity and inclusion, uh, not only the individual rights, but also the collective rights of the eth all, all of the ethnic peoples as well. So in the charter, we also framed a roadmap uh, for, the, for the drafting of the Constitution and, and the establishment of the Federal Union as well. So, uh, the military attempted to spark a way for non-violent uh, protests across the country, but uh, the military cracked down the demonstrations and non-violent movement gradually turned into a uh, armed resistance. Uh, because of the very brutal repression of the military. Uh, so I would uh, like to say some examples. For example, uh, the military blocked the main roads and, uh, and checked the, all the passers-by. And then it found some suspicious thing. Uh, they arrested, arrested people and tortured the people. And sometimes in, during the inter interrogation study, uh, uh, the people died. and they, Send uh, the dead body back to the family members, and they said that they died because of the heart attack or something like that. And then they, sometimes they even extorted money in exchange for the dead body as well. Uh, and then they uh, uh, sometimes they uh, when they invaded and sought the house and tried to find uh, the person they wanted to arrest. But they, they couldn't find the one, and then they arrested the relatives of that person and took hostage, or things like that. Uh, and then uh, later, about six months ago, they started to raid the, uh, and, uh, the villages, and they entered into the villages, uh, shooting indiscriminate, indiscriminately, and banned houses, looted uh, people's properties, uh, and they and people's properties like many livestock and vehicles, and they committed massacre, and uh, yeah, I, it, it will never end if I, if I tell their atrocities. So, and they, they also created some sort of the militia group as well. These militia groups in the villages, especially in the villages, uh, retaliated um, for the, the, the people in the villages for supporting the national unity government of the National League for Democracy as well. And uh, like Priscilla said, that they, uh, the military also bought uh, YEK-135 fighter jets, MI-35 helicopters, and Sukhoi fighter jets from Russia Federation and some other countries as well. And they, uh, attacked and bombed even purely civilian targets, uh, killing many people on the ground. For example, in September, uh, two military helicopters opened fire at a school in Sakai region, killing 13 people, including seven children. Just a, just a school, uh, just a school. And very recently, fighter jets car carried out an airstrike and bombed a, an open concert and killing more than 70 pe uh, people, mostly civilians. Uh, so uh, they are in discriminate and disproportionate use of violence would continue because they would like to stabilize the country before they, uh, because they have a plan to hold another election, another, another election next year. So they are trying to uh, uh, stabilize the, can the whole country. So I, uh, uh, as of November 2020, uh, the military killed more, more than 2,400 uh, innocent civilians and detained uh, almost 1,300 uh, civilians arbitrarily across the country, according to the data of the uh, Assistance Association of Political Prisoners. Uh, according to the UNOCHA report, uh, there has uh, now been more than 1.1 million uh, internally displaced persons across the country uh, because of the mi uh, military scorched out of uh, campaigns and banning and destroying the whole villages. 
So I would say that these barbaric actions are amount to uh, the serious international crimes, such as war crimes and crimes against humanity. Uh, so the violent movement gradually turned, like I said, turned into the full-blown people's defense forces and the people's defense war. Uh, Non-violent protesters uh, on, on the streets, especially the young people, were uh, to the periphery of the country, and they got some trainings from the ethnic defense groups, and then they founded the uh, People's Defense Forces. So in the very beginning, uh, nobody believed that these uh, PDFs, People's Defense Forces, uh, would be able to fight against the military because the military is uh, well-trained and uh, conventional army of 450,000 troops, uh, one of the biggest army in the, in, in the region. Uh, but after passing uh, 20 months, uh, the People's Defense Forces has shown its determination, courage, resistance, resilience, and guerrilla tactics, and they are not existing everywhere in, in the country, uh, hundreds of units uh, in the entire country. Uh, all that make the military troops stretched and exhausted without taking a rest in a single day. So. Uh, so now there have so far been 300 uh, people's defense forces, uh, battalions, uh, and the right con command and control of the national, national unity government. And there are more armed resistance groups, other armed resistance group groups, uh, we call it the local defense forces, uh, that are not uh, under the national unity government. So uh, I would... Uh, until now, we, the people of Myanmar, have been very uh, resolutely fighting against the military dictatorship. And uh, the funding, the main source of our funding came from our international Myanmar diaspora, because nobody, no country supported us. Uh, but uh, we, uh, will, we are very much determined to continue our struggle, our revolution. So in, in conclusion, I would say that there is still a window of opportunity for the international community to help our people's revolution and resistance movement and to see the democratic society, like President said, the standing in a geopolitically very uh, important critical location in the region. Thank you very much. So if there are any questions, we can elaborate on whatever you'd like. Yes. Uh, Tim DeRoach from World Oregon. Um, the U.S. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. Um, the U.S. and the international community, including the U.N., seem to be leaning heavily on ASEAN and the five-point consensus. And I'm wondering if you can discuss that. And also, what can and should the U.S. be doing to adequately address the situation? And as we see the Burmese military shift away from ground troops and more towards airstrikes, would a ban on aviation fuel make a significant impact to weaken things? Could you repeat the last part, please? Yeah, um, it's really, should, should the U.S. call for a ban on, on, on aviation fuel? Is that going to help a ban on aviation fuel aviation on lips fuel. to limit airstrikes? Well, we have been trying to ban aviation fuel, but it's not that easy because aviation fuel also powers civilian aircraft. It's all mixed together at the airports, and the military controls it all. Um, what so about targeted sanctions on Myanmar oil and we gas? We have targeted sanctions on individual members of the junta government, uh, so-called government, it's not really a government, the junta control, and, and major uh, cronies, uh, and those that are engaged in the arms tra trade in both Thailand and Singapore. But it's not an easy matter to get at their bank accounts, because very often they're under false names or somebody else's name, and you have to trace track them to find what the bank, where the bank accounts are. But it is, over, over a long period of time, it's quite effective. In fact, I would say that particularly our sanctions against cronies 
uh, who are mostly ex-military, but not only, um, is what brought about the original transition in 2010. There was a lot of pressure on the military leadership to improve the economy. That couldn't be done without foreign investment, but our sanctions made foreign investment virtually nil. But once they opened up, released political introduced freedoms, the investors came, and the economy really, it did wonders for the economy. Um, but the military leadership, after 10 years of this freedom, felt that they were losing power because the NLD actually came into uh, leadership in the government. They were introducing reforms in the economy that gradually removed the military from some of its economic assets because they had owned everything before, but they were being removed. They didn't like that, hence the coup. The coup was also, I mean, driven by the ego of the top military leader. There's no question about that. Um, but his, his comrades in the military leadership supported him in it, so you could say it was the whole military leadership. Um, the U.S. has difficulty reaching the country because it's surrounded by countries that don't want others to get into it. China doesn't have a region. Um, India is it's a very remote area. India doesn't want US. It would be hard for us to operate across that border anyway. Thailand is essentially a military-run government, um, and they are sympathetic with the military in Burma, so they want to be careful about um, freeing all their border too to outside intervention. So humanitarian assistance trickles across the border through um, civil society and NGO operations. And in fact, the U.S. government channels a lot of money. Now, people don't see that. They think it's just an NGO operating. The, the organization that I work for, the U.S. Institute of Peace, is funded by the U.S. government only by the U.S. government. We cannot take private money. And we, are, we have a very large Myanmar program on the ground in there supporting the resistance, and it's all funded by the U.S. government. So in effect, we're an extension of U.S. policy. Even though we're independent and we make our own decisions, in the end, we operate at the expense of the U.S. government. So we have to remain in close consultation with them. Um, so what the kind of, 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 of support that we're giving to the resistance is coming indirectly, and, it, and a lot of it isn't seen. And then there are other things that the U.S. government really doesn't want to advertise because it could get people on the ground into trouble um, very easily. We have to work at, at arm's length. We work very closely with um, resistance organizations. They carry out an awful lot of what we want to see happening there. The one thing we cannot do is supply arms, lethal um, assistance. Everything up to lethal is fine, but not lethal assistance. And we're always expanding the sanctions. In fact, we just added more arms dealers to the sanctions. But it takes us a while to find out. When I say us, I'm, I'm not in the government anymore, but I still try to speak for the government. But when I say us, I mean the U.S. government is trying all the time to expand the sanctions. Um, one other thing that's happening there is, is the, uh, the influx of Chinese criminal networks, because the country has become so lawless under military, this military control, with the military being the, the principal corruption, source of corruption in the country. Um, they've allowed these, these criminal networks to build whole cities along the Thai border and the Chinese border where they're, they're, they're um, making money off gambling, um, schemes, investment schemes, and they're hostage taking. They're taking hostages, young people from all over the region, promising them lucrative jobs and then making them run these schemes. Uh, so the governments in the region are getting very upset. Now back to your ASEAN question. That's a default position that was, I would say, inspired by China. China originally said, we want ASEAN 
it's, it's, it's really ASEAN that should be taking lead on this. ASEAN is not necessarily a political organization. It was formed for economic cooperation. And it, its political makeup is, is very diverse. I mean, it goes from sort of former communist countries, well, Laos is still a communist country, to democracies. Um, and, and the evolution, political evolution within ASEAN since its inception has been really quite remarkable. So there are big, they have trouble coming to consensus on political issues. So China did that purposely, and, and the US doesn't have an alternative. What are we going to do? Um, we have very strong interests with ASEAN as a whole. We're the, one of the largest trading partners uh, we make one of the biggest investors in those countries. And it, following the president's visit there recently, our relationship with ASEAN has become even stronger. But they're beginning to see the potential regional impact of what's going on in Burma, and they are very concerned about it. And now that Indo Indonesia is taking the presidency of ASEAN, I think we're going to see more activity on their part. They also are starting to speak out against the rest of us, saying, you can't put all the blame on us. You can't put the whole burden of solving this problem on us. You have to do more. We're going to hear more about that. Great. Thanks. Great clarification. Uh, what, what, what would you like to see uh, the U.S. do? I think uh, we have seen a lot of sanctions imposed on the military conduct uh, uh, by um, the the U.S. and other countries like EU and U.K. and the Canada or things like that. But as long as I think uh, we couldn't impose the sanction on the MOG sector, the Mawalaka sector, uh, the WT will get a, a lot of revenues and everything, uh, every year more than uh, one billion dollars. So they will survive. So we need to uh, focus to impose sanctions on the MOG, MOG sector specifically. MOGE, Myanmar Oil and Gas Enterprise, is a government owned business. And it handles all of the oil and gas imports and provision in the country and feeds the military. The military profits directly enormously from MOGE. And there's been a lot of talk about us sanctioning MOGE. The U.S. government would like to do that, but there are costs that we haven't been able to face up to yet. One of them is Thailand. Um, there's a, a gas field in the Andaman Sea, Myanmar is part of the Andaman Sea, that feeds a large part of the Thai electricity system. And so it would turn lights off in Thailand, who is still an ally of the United States. We have alliances in the region, um, and MOGE, you know, again, it's, it's one of Myanmar's wealth, sources of wealth is, is its, its energy resources. And um, the US government, I think, is getting very close to the point where they probably will slap sanctions on MOGE. Um, but we also have a US oil company involved, Chevron. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <Hello>. sorry. <laughs> I didn't see the line down there. I'm so sorry. Go ahead. No worries. I have a two-part question. How is the National Unity Government able to listen to and support the people they're governing? And also, how are they becoming able to meet real needs of the people they're governing? First of all, I think we are not an exiled government, although I'm in, 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 in this country. So most of our ministers are stay in cities and uh, uh, find in the cancer military dictatorship. So uh, our people could control some of the areas, especially in the upper part of our country. So we are now trying to provide some services to these people that we could uh, uh, living in the area that we could control, uh, like the healthcare services, uh, education, but things like that. And then we could uh, expand our area as well. And another thing is that, uh, like Brazil, Brazil said, we have a lot of the ethnic groups in our country, and ethnic 
uh, what we call resistance groups. So we, are, we have been in collaboration with all these, all, not all, most of the ethnic resistance groups, and then uh, trying to make alliance with them, and then uh, at the same time trying to provide assistance to our people as well. I could add that in, in some of the ethnic areas where they have major armies, um, they actually had established some of their own local administration. And so during this revolution, that a degree of local administration has expanded tremendously because the PDFs mm -hmm. target the military administrators and have basically chased them out of huge parts of the country. So. The PDFs and the and the resistance groups, particularly those who have have left the government, the what was called the CDM, the Civil Disobedience Movement. Their doctors, lawyers, their um, administrators, they have joined the resistance. So they come into these regions and set up their own administrative facilities. But it's still very unstable because when the military sees this happening, they come in and pound it with air power whole villages, they burn down the houses, they burn down the shops, um, and they've done that all over the country. So it's still a cat and mouse game. Yes. No, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Hi, my name is Julie Jimenez, and I'm from the Nebraska Council. Uh, fortunately, in my position at the University of Nebraska at Omaha, I host uh, young Southeast Asian leaders from the Waisili Institute, many from Myanmar. Um, our area of focus is engagement and that many of these young leaders are the most at risk in their country for the issues that they're addressing. What would be your message and recommendation for these young leaders uh, in Myanmar that are promoting peace and addressing social issues? I think we, uh, we don't want to be the problem in our region. Uh, the, the, uh, that is a, why we are trying to abolish the, the military dictatorship. So it is, that's the reason why we call it revolution. Uh, by revolution, I, I mean that uh, just trying this existing system and replacing it with a uh, more working system for our country. So we are now trying to establish this dictatorship system and then trying to establish a, a federal democratic union, which is the cause uh, for uh, the ethnic resistance uh, revolution for more than 70 years. So uh, we also, we need to address the root causes of our country uh, and then we will try to establish a federal democratic union. That will be, uh, that would also be good for the region, the whole region as well. So I would, I would like to give the message to the, uh, uh, some uh, other members of this uh, ASEAN uh, that we are trying to be better, we are trying to establish a good system in our country, so we also need as assistance from the young people uh, of the ASEAN and the Southeast Asian nations as well. And I would say that the younger generation in Myanmar is very anxious to connect with the outside world, unlike their elders. There's a big generation gap in the country. It's the young people that are saying, we don't like the way you've been running the country anymore. We want to be part of the world. And that started to happen during the The military has tried to close it all down. But they very much want to be associated with their neighbors, their young neighbors. So uh, to the extent that those young neighbors can connect with you know, the young people that are fighting the military regime, it will help them. Here again. Uh, the, uh, I'm Jeremy Lewis from Alabama World Affairs Council, uh, I'm operating from up here. Um, the, uh, there was some evidence after the military coup that some of the violence against Rohingyas in particular came from uh, false uh, reports in social media, particularly Facebook, and there were waves of uh, social media attacks followed by waves of violent attacks. Uh, and, and Facebook claimed they didn't have the ability to intervene in foreign languages and so Has that improved or has that got worse? Has it migrated? Uh, how far has social media affected the violence? 
Um, Facebook was definitely part of the problem um, in the country. And Facebook, I can speak a little bit about that because we have been trying to work closely with Facebook. Our, we have local Burmese staff. Um, we have for many years in the country, and, and they were communicating with, with Facebook in the region. It's really hard to get at some of the symbolism, the memes, the, the uh, alternate use of the language and so forth that was very um, incendiary, but you know, it, take, it would change daily. Facebook was trying to keep up with it, but I don't think they, they did. In, the so in a way, the young people have moved from Facebook in, in Burma, and they're, they're using other forms of, mm -hmm. of communication, um, particularly encrypted. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, and Facebook plays a much, much less of a role. But the military in particular abused Facebook. Mm -hmm. And yes, it was not only a, a, a factor in, the, in uh, the violence against the Rohingya, Muslims in general in the country. There's a much larger Muslim population. Um, and it's still a problem because the military is, is very um, nationalist, Bama Buddhist. Uh, it, it just doesn't tolerate diversity of religion or, or nationality, ethnic nationality. Do you want to add anything to that about Facebook or um, social media? They used to manipulate, I mean, the, the military Honda used to manipulate the, uh, Facebook for their uh, political fairness. Everybody uh, realized that it is just, a, uh, it, it's just a, a, what the military is trying to manipulate. Now they are, uh, as soon as possible, uh, because it is the most important thing that we have to do immediately. Uh, and the social cohesion uh, in, in, in the region, because in that area, in Rakhai State, there's another uh, ethnic nationality group. So uh, for, for the long term, then uh, the, there, is, there is a pro program that uh, uh, should encourage people living in peaceful, peaceful region. So that, that is another matter. And another thing is that we need to have the development programs as well. Uh, because some of the problem, problems are much related to the economic prob problems. So uh, we have a very comprehensive uh, plan uh, to address the uh, uh, causes of that, uh, that, that problem. Because there is not only one problem, there are a lot of problems and they're related to each other. So we need to address all the problems at the same time, which is very important. That, that that is our policy towards uh, Rohingya people. There are also Rohingya members of the N NUG. Um, the citizenship law that he mentioned is really the heart of the problem. The military created it and used it for decades to displace minorities. The only ethnic group in the country that has full access to social, political, economic, um, doors is the Bama. They are sort of, the citizenship has three different layers, the way the military used it. The Muslims, Rohingya, are at the bottom. And there are many other people in the country, including Chinese uh, immigrants who've been there for generations who don't have full citizenship. There's sort of full citizenship, there's associate citizenship, and the, the ethnic groups are only associate citizens, really. They don't have and not, none of them has full access that the minor, majority group does. So it's a very 
badly structured society. And the NEG wants to eliminate that citizenship law and create a new one that has equality for all. So that would be a major, major social difference in the country. And, and if once they do that, the society will have to adjust to it because over the years, a lot of social prejudices, of course, have been built into the society. We all know what that's like. Um, and so they have to go through a process of washing them out, uh, essentially. So it's a long process. Let's make this the last question, sir. Okay. Yeah. Uh, very quickly, um, where is Aung San Suu Kyi? Uh, you have a leader in this, and you're slightly in the new resistance, but she seems to have disappeared. Um, where, is, where is she at? Because she could be a great fit. She's in jail in Notre Dame, okay. in the capital. Um, in in um, confinement, incommunicado, all alone. Probably not doing very well. I, I have one quick question, which is, could you describe Generation Z in uh, uh, Burma? Uh, the younger generation, uh, you sketched out a little bit of it, <coughs> but um, what are they like? They, they seem to be very dynamic. They're armed and fighting. <laughs> the PDFs the are all <laughs> Gen <Yeah>. Z. <laughs> Most of the Gen Z are uh, the not members of the uh, PDFs. So the Generation Z got a chance to vote uh, for the first time in their life in 2015 and 2020 as well. So they got a, ch they got a, ch a chance to taste the little bit of uh, freedom and democracy uh, during a very brief period of eight years, I would say, from two, uh, uh, 2012 to 2020. So they, uh, they, they love the taste of the uh, freedom and democracy. That, that is the reason why they uh, participate in the uh, very peaceful demonstrations across the country. And then now they trying to fight against the military dictatorship because they love the taste of the democracy and freedom that they have experienced in a very short brief, brief uh, period of time. And they were so creative in the way that they were, they were running their peaceful protests that they ran circles around the military and the military got frustrated and that's why they resorted to killing them. Yeah. I mean, they were purposely aiming at the young people. It sort of, it sort of sums up <coughs> the, the sadness, the tragedy that they uh, had, had experienced, but that the hope that they also bring for the future, for the possibilities. Yeah. So I want to thank you really <laughs> so much, Maru. Please have a clap. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I, I hope that those of you who determine your speakers out and around the country will think about putting Myanmar in your program because I believe very strongly that the, the NUG and, and the, the struggle that's going on in, in Burma is, receives a lot more gra grassroots level attention here. And our press, understandably, is diverted by what's going on in Ukraine because it does have more relevance to U.S. security. But we also need to understand that what's happening in Burma ultimately affects us too. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much.